This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Kent Fulmer. A Tale of Two Cities by Charles Dickens. Book 2, Chapter 20. A Plea. When the newly married pair came home, the first person who appeared to offer his congratulations was Sidney Carton. They had not been at home many hours when he presented himself. He was not improved in habits or in looks or in manner, but there was a certain rugged air of fidelity about him, which was new to the observation of Charles Darnay. He watched his opportunity of taking Darnay aside into a window and of speaking to him when no one overheard. "'Mr. Darnay,' said Carton, "'I wish we might be friends.' "'We're already friends, I hope.' "'You are good enough to say so as a fashion of speech, but I don't mean any fashion of speech. Indeed, when I say I wish we might be friends, I scarcely mean quite that either.' Charles Darnay, as was natural, asked him in all good humor and good fellowship what did he mean. "'Upon my life,' said Carton, smiling, "'I find it easier to comprehend in my own mind than to convey to yours. However, let me try.' You remember a certain famous occasion when I was more drunk than than usual? I remember a certain famous occasion when you forced me to confess that you had been drinking. I remember it, too. The curse of those occasions is heavy upon me, for I always remember them. I hope it may be taken into account one day when all days are at an end for me. Don't be alarmed. I am not going to preach. I am not at all alarmed. Earnestness in you is anything but alarming to me. Ah, said Carton, with a careless wave of his hand, as if he waved that away. On the drunken occasion in question, one of a large number, as you know, I was insufferable about liking you and not liking you. I wish you would forget it. I forgot it long ago. Fashion of speech again. But, Mr. Darnay, oblivion is not so easy to me as you represent it to be to you. I have by no means forgotten it, and a light answer does not help me to forget it. If it was a light answer, returned Darnay, I beg your forgiveness for it. I had no other object than to turn a slight thing, which to my surprise seems to trouble you too much aside. I declare to you on the faith of a gentleman that I have long dismissed it from my mind. Good heaven! What was there to dismiss? Have I had nothing more important to remember in the great service you rendered me that day? As to the great service, said Carton, I am bound to avow to you, when you speak of it that way, that it was mere professional claptrap. I don't know that I cared what became of you when I rendered it. Mind, I say when I rendered it, I am speaking of the past. You make light of the obligation, returned Darnay, but I will not quarrel with your light answer. Genuine truth, Mr. Darnay, trust me. I have gone aside from my purpose. I was speaking about our being friends. Now you know me. You know I am incapable of all the higher and better flights of men. If you doubt it, ask Stryver, and he'll tell you so. I prefer to form my own opinion without the aid of his. Well, at any rate, you know me as a dissolute dog who has never done any good and never will. I don't know that you never will. But I do, and you must take my word for it. Well, if you could endure to have such a worthless fellow, and a fellow of such indifferent reputation, coming and going at odd times, I should ask that I might be permitted to come and go as a privileged person here, that I might be regarded as a useless, and, I would add, if it were not for the resemblance I detected between you and me, an unornamental piece of furniture, tolerated for its old service, and taken no notice of. I doubt if I should abuse the permission. It is a hundred to one if I should avail myself of it four times in a year. It would satisfy me, I dare say, to know that I had it. Will you try? That is another way of saying that I am placed on the footing I have indicated. I thank you, Darnay. I may use that freedom with your name. I think so, Carton, by this time. They shook hands upon it, and Sidney turned away. Within a minute afterwards, he was, to all outward appearances, as unsubstantial as ever. When he was gone, and in the course of an evening passed with Miss Pross, the doctor, and Mr. Lorry, Charles Darnay made some mention of this conversation in general terms, and spoke of Sidney Carton as a problem of carelessness and recklessness. He spoke of him in short, not bitterly, more meaning to bear hard upon him, but as anybody might who saw him as he showed himself. He had no idea that this could dwell in the thoughts of his fair young wife, but when he afterwards joined her in their own rooms, he found her waiting for him with the old pretty lifting of the forehead strongly marked. "'We are thoughtful tonight,' said Darnay, drawing his arm about her. "'Yes, dearest Charles,' 
with her hands on his breast, and the inquiring and attentive expression fixed upon him. "'We are rather thoughtful tonight, for we have something on our mind tonight.' "'What is it, my Lucy?' "'Will you promise not to press one question on me, if I beg you not to ask it?' "'Will I promise? What will I not promise you, my love?' "'What indeed?' with his hand putting aside the golden hair from the cheek, and his other hand against the heart that beat for him. I think, Charles, poor Mr. Carton deserves more consideration and respect than you expressed for him tonight. Indeed, my own? Why so? That is what you are not to ask me, but I think. I know he does. If you know it, it is enough. What would you have me do, my life? I would ask you, my dearest, to be very generous with him, always, and very lenient on his faults when he is not by. I would ask you to believe that he has a heart he very, very seldom reveals, and that there are deep wounds in it. My dear, I have seen it bleeding. It is a painful reflection to me, said Charles Darnay, quite astounded, that I should have done him any wrong. I never thought this of him. My husband, it is so. I fear he is not to be reclaimed. There is scarcely a hope that anything in his character or fortunes is repairable now, but I am sure he is capable of good things, gentle things, even magnanimous things. She looked so beautiful in the purity of her faith in this lost man that her husband could have looked at her as she was for hours. And, oh, my dearest love, she urged, clinging nearer to him, laying her head upon his breast and raising her eyes to his, remember how strong we are in our happiness and how weak he is in his misery. The supplication touched him home. I will always remember it, dear heart. I will remember it as long as I live. He bent over the golden head, and put the rosy lips to his, and folded her in his arms. If one forlorn wanderer, then pacing the dark streets, could have heard her innocent disclosure, and could have seen the drops of pity kissed away by her husband from the soft blue eyes, so loving of that husband, he might have cried to the night, and the words would not have parted from his lips for the first time. God bless her for her sweet compassion. End of Book 2, Chapter 20